Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to wait for a couple of minutes and then we'll start the webinar. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Anna and I'm a PhD student and a project coordinator at the Lao China Institute and I'll be hosting this webinar session today. This webinar will be in a panel discussion format where the author will engage in a discussion about the book with our chair. As audience, as audience members, you can send us questions through the Q&A box below, which the panel will answer during the Q&A session after the panel discussion. I also wanted to note that my colleague Julia is on the back end as a co-host in case my connection drops off for some reason. So today's event is our first event of the Lao China Institute's book talk series. This series provides an opportunity for, for our students and academics to hear from leading China scholars and authors around the world. In today's webinar, Professor Hilton Root would talk about this new book, Network Origins of the Global Economy, in conversation with Dr. Shinson. Professor Root, is a Fulbright Senior Distinguished Chair in the Social Sciences at King's and Professor of Public Policy at George Mason University Shah School of Policy and Government. He's held academic appointments at the UIBE in Beijing, Caltech, University of Penn and Stanford University. Dr. Shinsen is a Senior Lecturer in Chinese and East Asian Business. He received his PhD in Political Science from Northwestern University in 2014. Prior to joining King's, he's held academic positions at the University of Oxford and Trinity College Dublin. I'd now like to hand it over to Dr. Shinson. Welcome, Shin. Sorry, um, just to start my video and unmute myself. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Um, great. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this event. And thank you, Anna, for this very kind introduction. Um, uh, as Anna introduced, I'm Xin Sun um, here at the Lao China Institute. So uh, it's a great honor for me to be here to host or chair this great book event. Um, uh, 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 you know, great work written by Professor Hilton Root. So, um, as agreed, so I, I guess I will, you know, because you haven't got a chance, most of you haven't got a chance to read this book. So I will start with providing a very brief summary of the book's major uh, argument and analysis from a reader's perspective. You know, of course it's gonna be, you know, a very inaccurate summary, but just to, uh, to hope to give every, everybody a bird's eye view on the, this great work. And then I'll, you know, start this conversation with uh, Professor Root. And after that, we're gonna leave time for Q&A um, with the audience. So overall, you know, I spent uh, several days reading this book very carefully. And this is, a, as I mentioned, an excellent work. It's very exciting because I think it addresses several big historical, big issues in, um, you know, uh, the um, historical and the contemporary issues in global political economy. And also what I find this book very interesting, exciting is that it also sheds important lights on the future of the world. So basically my understanding is that the uh, Professor Root started with uh, what he called the five transitions. Um, you know, those are transitions that happened in the global history of political economy. And these transitions, including the rise and the fall of monarchies in China and Europe, as well as the different patterns of dynastic succession. The second transition is the formation of the Western legal system and the Western law. The third transition he discussed is industrial revolution. 
And the fourth one is China's more recent economic reform from a socialist economy towards a market oriented economy and China's rise as a global power. And the last the transition he has been talking about is you know, the, the, the transition that happens in the whole world. The words transition to uh, globalization, to a multipolar international system, and a much more interconnected global economy. So basically, uh, in this book, Professor Root draws on the existing theories of complex systems to provide explanations for all these five transitions, all these great topics. For example, he calls the political systems of both China and Europe in their pre-modern history hyper networks, okay? And he then argues the uh, systemic features of different hyper networks in China and Europe could eventually lead to different outcomes of political and economic development. And more, for example, you know, he argues that in ancient China, the political system or hyper network was more like a hierarchical hub and a spoke network. Well, in Europe, under the feudal system, under the feudal monarchies, it was more like a small world, better connected network. Each network has their unique features. China's hub and the spoke network, according to uh, Professor Root, it was more centralized. The lateral connections between lower level nodes or units were relatively weak. Uh, and in contrast, the, the European political system was more decentralized and the lower units or nodes uh, have better connections through intermarriages across different uh, uh, royal houses. Uh, then, you know, he further argues that under European decentralized and interconnected political systems, king, kings, and the wind, but the overall hyper network was very resilient and also a legal framework that was based on what we call, what, what, you know, it was similar with what we call today, the rule of law has emerged in this European hyper network and also industrial revolution took place. And then, you know, under the Chinese political system, uh, highly centralized, we saw the cycles of uh, dynastic decay and the renewal. You know, uh, this system prioritized the stability but also prevented lateral communication and the uh, correspondence and the deterred innovation, eventually leading to the great divergence in the trajectory of economic development between China and Europe. So this is my you know, very uh, simplistic understanding of the major thrust of this, uh, you know, uh, again, excellent book that touch upon very important global issues. Um, so now let me, I wanna start this, um, you know, Professor Professor Root, I want to ask you, what motivates you to focus on this this topic? You know, what what brought you into this field? So um, let me break that question into two parts. One, um, I my interest in China goes back to my growing up in a household with a, a father who who had spent many years in China. Uh, during World War II and then thereafter. Um, and so as a boy growing up, China was a very normal part of, you know, what we discussed, what we thought about as a family. And then my own interests, um, even in high school, were very strongly focused on, on China-U.S. relations. And um, I was eventually able to um, study with uh, John Fairbank, who has, remains a great inspiration to me. Uh, and over the course of my career, I've team taught courses on um, economic growth uh, in China and, uh, and the West with a number of scholars who, whose knowledge of, of, of China is far deeper than mine, including someone I would want to mention at the University of Pennsylvania, Robert Hartwell. Uh, who was on in the process of writing a, a great book about the actually network system of China using data from uh, Ming Dynasty uh, and Tang Dynasty connections among uh, bureaucratic families. Um, but that work was never continued because of his untimely early death. Um, so my own academic background was primarily in 
European economic history and in economic de development. And um, in the when I started my career, uh, China was not part of the growing economies of the world, so there, were, there was nothing to, uh, to to report on until you know the late 1990s. And um, then it became increasingly clear to me, um, as Jin mentioned, the great transitions uh, in in world economic history. The one that people tended to talk about with regard to uh, China and the West was the so-called Great Divergence, uh, sometimes called the European Miracle, uh, which, as and and what economic historians ref are referring to, are Western industrialization, GDP rates, living standards that surge far beyond China's, uh, and there's a lively literature and economics on this particular topic. But as we know, this divergent has for the most part vanished. Uh, China is today highly industrialized and fully integrated into the world economy. So what I've done is to look at through this lens of network analysis and systems analysis, to look at more ancient variations between the two regions that persisted and and are actually rooted in fundamental differences of network structures. Uh, and so the book seeks those out, one of which at the level of the, the hyper networks, the overarching political unity of the of these regions uh, and subsequently my work has delved into the formation of those structures, those hyper network structures and the kinds of social institutions they gave rise to and how they're embedded in the social fabric in the form of political and ethical norms. Um, so let me turn back to, um, to you, Jin. Yeah, yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Root. So, you know, since you mentioned that the great divergence is one of the issues or topics that motivate you to pursue this new analysis, uh, pursue this analysis. So I wanna start with this great divergence because, you know, this is also a topic we have touched upon in some of our classes at the China Institute, because I see some of the master students are in the um, audience. So, you know, I wonder, you know, they may also get interested in this topic. So, yeah, so there are some existing explanations for the great divergence, the Europeans economic takeoff industrial revolution while China lagged behind. Uh, and some of them actually attribute the divergence to the uh, differences in the political system between the two countries. Like some people say China is more centralized, there is a unitary system. Well, you know, the, the Europe's are a more decentralized in the feudal system. So how, how can we understand the great divergence from the network approach? How does your approach, you know, um, adding additional insights into our existing understanding of this topic? So uh, let me just say that, although I, I'm very interested in, in that particular transition, as you noted, there are other great transitions that predated this, the rise of the European legal system, uh, the rise of the European monarchies, um, the interconnectedness of those monarchies. And so the book really talks about the different early transitions and how not only do they predate, but there are persistent effects from those that, that continue to be observable into the present. So how does my approach differ? Well, so um, during the last 20 years, uh, there have been very significant discoveries in network science. Uh, and these have shifted the focus of social network analysis, uh, which traditionally focused on single nodes and small graph connections. Uh, and with new computational tools, uh, we can now map large scale properties uh, of the network itself. Uh, and so this allows us to exchange, uh, expand the range of our analysis 
to an entire system. Um, and that's basically what I've done is to take advantage of the, some of these innovations um, in network theory uh, and, and to do so to collect global information about structures such as the existence of what uh, network theorists call small world or scale-free characteristics, which we might talk about later. Uh, and by doing this, we can show what the different properties of the system level connectivities are, how they influence the diffusion of innovation of behaviors, how they influence uh, cooperation, uh, how the systems themselves evolve or co-evolve with the communities they support. Um, and we, in this particular book, I'm very concerned with the innovation cultures of the two uh, regions. And uh, I think network analysis helps us to go deeper into the question of how innovation diffuses or spreads. Uh, and when we get deeply into that, we can see how the network structures, uh, something Jin has mentioned, afford different advantages to each society. So I'll just state five topic areas that the book covers that you know really haven't been integrated in a single uh, approach prior to, to, to my book. One is connectivity itself, how the system topology enables communities to network into complexity. So you have these two complex civilizations. The patterns of, inconnect, of interconnectivity among elite political actors, which Shin mentioned, uh, and that this creates system level differences in structure, uh, but they share an overarching institution, which is hereditary monarchy. And then I go into network structures and particularly the role of disruptive innovation uh, and then looking more microscopically, so now you know we shift from the macroscopic to the microscopic networks, we try to gain insights into the local networks, cultural diffusion, and the organization of cooperation within local systems. And there's an enormous divergence there between uh, China and the West. So, so, you know, because I guess Professor Roots, uh, you know, some of our audience may not be very familiar with the uh, complex systems or the network analysis. You, you, you know, you basically describe the Chinese political system in the uh, dynasties. You know, you use the term hub and the spoke network or hub and and the spoke uh, uh, hyper network. Well, in the European system, you use the term a small world network. Um, so I guess because your book has some graphs in it, show us how these different networks exactly look like you using graphs. Um, but you know, because our audience may not have the luxury to read your book yet. So could you say a little bit more about how this small world network in Europe differ from this uh, a hub and the spoke network in China? Is that just a matter of centralization versus decentralization or is there anything else? So we've always been stuck on this notion of centralization and decentralization, which is entirely correct, but there are many different kinds of centralized and decentralized structures and we increasingly can identify some of the more general system level properties. So for example, uh, network theorists talk about small world properties uh, of high local connectivity and relatively short average path lengths. So this means that um, you can have very short path lengths from one node in a system to any other by going from one hub to another hub. So, so this hub-based um, topography, which we, we, we now know is the key to how the internet works, was also the key to how the European monarchies basically uh, created stability and uh, a shared identity within the European system. So you had highly skewed degree distributions. In other words, very uh, many, connective, many connections to a few small hubs or I should say to a few large hubs that, that but they're, 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 they're distributed around the system. They're not centralized. 
Uh, and so, but this created dis, dis, disadvantages for European monarchs that Chinese emperors did not have to uh, face. Uh, first disadvantage was this, this, this distributed topography enabled information originating in any part of the continent of Europe to flow via universities, guilds, courts, trade to other parts without the need to pass through a central node. And this meant that the European monarchs could had limited capacity to spread, to stop the spread of disruptive ideas or disruptive innovations. And this also prevented the royal families to control the systems of production and to gain a grip over the entire economy. In China, as we know, there was a system that act, the, 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 of, of uh, a network of, of, of um, officials uh, of, the, of, the, of the emperor that were actually able to filter out disruptive ideas and innovations. And so we all know from a very rudimentary understand, I mean, uh, very basic understanding of Chinese history that many of the innovations that we, uh, that allowed Europe to become hegemonic in global affairs actually originated in China but they were repressed in China. Mm -hmm. They were not only repressed, but individuals associated them with them were often executed. Uh, that ability to repress potentially disruptive innovation, that is innovations that would have given rise to new network systems um, that the monarchs couldn't control, that, that capacity to do that was something the Europeans didn't have. Um, so I can say a little bit more about that, but let me just go back to, to Shin and this is this is thank you professor this is tremendously interesting because you said the european system uh, the small world network is more kind of a, have have greater deals of local uh, connectivity well in china you know even though all the local power centers are under a universal political system but the interconnectivity between these lower units or nodes uh, were comparatively weaker than in the European case. This reminds me of what happened during the pandemic. If you see at the early stages of the pandemic, you know, each local government officials in China, they have their own track and trade system. You know, in China, they call that system house code. Because, you know, for individuals, if you want to travel uh, uh, around, you need to demonstrate your house code is uh, green rather than red. But then, you know, each locality's local government use their own uh, uh, track and trade system without the kind of, adapt, um, you know, it's, it's not a, a, a adaptable towards other localities. So that created a local enclave or, you know, local closed system where information and uh, uh, people cannot easily flow out or flow in. Uh, so this might be one of the contemporary examples of what you said, the lower level of connectivity across different lower, uh, you know, uh, nodes. Uh, but then, you know, uh, if this kind of a lower connectivity prevented China from taking full advantage of innovation or potential innovations, and it also prevented uh, Chinese dynasties in the past from, uh, um, uh, for example, uh, establishing a unified market and uh, um, uh, uh, the spread of information and other innovative ideas. But how can we explain the recent economic miracle China has achieved, especially after the uh, Deng Xiaoping's economic reform? So if the hyper network structure remains unchanged, but then we, we all of a sudden see that China no longer lagged that far behind, but rather, you know, began to uh, enjoy very rapid economic development. So I just wonder uh, how can your uh, theory explain this recent economic miracle? Um, is that because we, we are seeing a network change in China or is that because something else? So, the miracle that we've seen, uh, the, the sudden rise of China and its rapid industrialization, modernization, um, uh, urbanization, um, it has many of the characteristics of 
former periods of economic growth in China, uh, reliance on informal institutions, uh, particularly at the local level of lineage groups. Uh, these lineage connectivities solve collective action problems, such as provisioning of local goods. But there's a continuous theme in Chinese history, the risk of collusion and corruption uh, among the uh, lineage groups and the negligible impact on, on local government accountability. Um, and, and so the question is, in that regard, China is not like many other traditional lineage-based, kinship-based societies. But yet, as you say, China has not found itself uh, stuck in economic and cultural inertia like many other kinship-intensive cultures. And I think this is because it has a meritocratic and relatively inclusive civil service system, which also reflects the history, uh, which has few parallels in history among uh, developing nations today or even in Europe. Um, and so it enables China to outperform other regimes that similarly depended on lineage organization to sustain cooperation among the wider population. Uh, so, but it also, and it has also enabled China to um, jumpstart or, or um, leapfrog into technologies using the um, state-owned enterprise system, using the system that derives from the central unity of the of the state. Uh, so in a sense, it's built a market economy uh, the same way it did in early periods. We already have extensive uh, documentation of the fact that even if you go back to uh, ancient uh, monarchies, uh, uh, empires such as the Tang and, and Ming dynasty, the percentage of state-owned enterprise or state-run uh, activities uh, far surpass anything uh, that could be found in Europe. Uh, and in many cases account for 10 to 12%, even in early dynasties of total economic activity. So in a sense, what China has done both then and today is building a, an economy um, and we could say, you know, going back, it was also a market economy, but but without the same institutions for trust building agreements among the populations that would enable a population to mobilize resources privately as arose in, in, in Europe. So again, it's a the it's lineage. Uh, at the local level, coupled with a dynamic state sector at the higher uh, the, at the at the national level, and a revival of the meritocratic civil service, so we have the uh, Gaokao um, system, the Chinese exam system, today for students that many of you have passed through, I'm sure, in this class and in this. Uh, it's a revival of the examination system of ancient times in many ways. It has so many parallels. So I I, I see the 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 rise of China today as having many of the traditional characteristics of the uh, ancient systems. Um, now, of course, mm -hmm. the next set of questions would probably be, what does this mean for the ultimate competitiveness and integration of China into the world economy? And I don't yeah. know if what you wanna discuss, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Actually, that's, that's exactly what, what I'm trying to uh, think of in my head here. So, because you know, I, I suppose China has experienced a four decades of catch catch up period, where uh, China can take advantage of the innovation that occurred everywhere else in the world, and you know, you know, organize a massive scale production within China, uh, taking advantage of you know the the you know what you called meritocracy based bureaucracy the 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 you know highly educated labor force the gaoco system etc cetera, etc cetera. but then eventually as china moves closer and closer to the frontier of uh technology global technology you know fundamentally i think some people would argue uh, you know, further economic growth over the next few decades in china will rely more highly on innovation, 
right? But your your analysis um, told us that in ancient China, you know, this um, hierarchical structure hyper network has been uh, preventing innovation from happening and also preventing innovation from being uh, used by uh, uh, by uh, uh, enterprises or by the states. Then do you still see the conflict or contradiction that will actually, uh, uh, you know, prevent China from, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, further economic growth in the future? Right. If if innovation will become more important in the next few decades, what do you think? So, I think the Chinese leadership fully recognizes that um, the future is uh, of China's econ economic growth is de will be determined by, as you said, innovation, not catch up growth. So then the question is to have an economy that. Um, sustains and, and, and promotes innovation, uh, what kind of you know, higher level governance organization is preferable? And so here, you know, the, 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 the question and the parallels with the past may actually be relatively uh, important. So when we talk about innovation, one of the distinctions between the European pattern and the Chinese pattern traditionally was that uh, the European pattern was one in which disruptive innovations, innovations that could disrupt the existing uh, social system and even the power hierarchies uh, could not be stopped uh, because there were so many different circuits that they could, um, uh, that they could follow. There was no way to inter interfere with their development. So the, the, the monarchs that were successful, the countries that were successful, the ones who harness disruptive forces. Uh, now the question is, in China, this, this notion that, that, that innovative uh, innovation can be disruptive is uh, very challenging uh, to the regime. And they you know, would, would continue uh, to try to ensure that it doesn't have uh, disruptive social and political consequences. But this is, you know, this, this is, um, th this could be, this could prevent uh, the innovation process from unfolding, uh, and it could lead to important innovations being repressed or from not having their full effect. Uh, and we can think of already several examples of this. Um, so, so um, that would be one one pattern that would be very concerning. Um, I'll just go back to you, Shin, because I, I know there are many other questions related to this, this topic. Right, yes. So uh, I guess, because, you know, I think we, we are, um, we need to leave uh, time for the Q&A with the audience. So um, I, I want to take this uh, opportunity to ask you perhaps a final question, yes. because you have mentioned with the rise of China into a global power, uh, we are now facing a quite different international hyper network in the world. You know, during the Cold War period, it was more kind of a bipolar system, uh, United, United States and Soviet Union, each organized their own international relations and also economic and the trade system. But now you're saying that the complexity and the lower level interconnection of global political economy has increased so much within the past few decades. And your book argues that this complexity, this lower level connection could actually potentially undermine the stability of the whole international system. So I guess, you know, this, this really is interesting to me because we have seen that in 2008 financial crisis, you know, some debt crisis in the American housing market spread out to the whole world and shake the global economy. But then also the pandemic, we see the interconnectivity across different regions leads to the breakout of the whole pandemic. So I suppose, you know, with this higher complexity of international connectivity, we need a international governing system or governance system to solve many global crises we are currently facing. But then on the other hand, 
you know, uh, we are seeing more and more countries adopting more nationalistic approaches with Brexit, with the election of Trump, and with the so-called decoupling between China and the United States. So this leads to a conflict between connectivity in globalization and the you know, nationalistic approaches adopted by individual powers. Right, so I wonder your your analysis, what kind of a, a, a prediction or what additional insights your analysis could uh, help us understand the evolution of future global political economy? So that's a great question. And um, let me say that I don't have a, a, a final answer, but if we look at this question from the perspective of, of complex systems theory, one thing we can see very clearly is that Cold War metaphors are useless in this regard in understanding the world today because we have interdependency within the system, uh, which would make something like decoupling extremely unrealistic, and I think everyone would agree, not um, in anyone's interest to pursue that route. It's also not a realistic uh, route at this point. It would, it would take us way, way back. Actually, we can't go back. So the question is, how do we go forward? So you mentioned um, what kind of global governance system uh, can there be? And so even if you take the pandemic and you look at China's approach to the pandemic, um, if, if every country in the world was to take China's approach and global trade would have come to a complete standstill during this period, um, no country really has uh, necessarily a better uh, answer to how to deal with this. So I think the fact that, that the pandemic has been dealt with in a somewhat decentralized way, and now we see different uh, solutions out there, different public policy approaches that are possible, don't forget, in cultural frameworks that are very, very divergent from each other. Uh, it, it's, it's rather obvious you would never have been able to impose the uh, controls and sur super surveillance that China has been able in any any Western country. I mean, you look at what's going on in, in Canada today uh, over, oh, oh, so, so it's necessary for a, um, um, a decentralized approach to uh, harness, to be harnessed by, by everyone. And, and, and China, of course, has a lot of trouble in its history of you know, being part of a decentralized problem solving system. So the, the problem so solving systems were always highly centralized ones and that and eliminating you know, certain options and preventing certain processes of, of experimentation from going forward if they didn't, you know, if they looked threatening uh so i think you know we are all going to have to make adjustments um including china and um the integration of uh, chinese businesses and civil society into global business and civil organization is you know an inevitable force that can only, in my opinion, lead to a, a stronger and, and, and uh, China and a stronger world. Uh, and, and that's a challenge, you know, obviously to, tra to traditional political instincts. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we're going to see changes uh, mm -hmm. within societies uh, as solutions to global problems become more urgent, uh, some of the historically traditional systems will, will have to uh, be remolded or redefined and uh, re re repurposed. Uh, and that's the process that we're going to see uh, unfold. And while nationalism is not in itself, I don't think a bad thing because we want strong national capabilities to continue to, to provide local solutions. Uh, but the notion of decoupling, you know, when nationalism goes to that that degree, then I think it becomes very, very, very uh, unsound. Uh, so I'm sure you 
there, there will be other questions related to this. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, great. Thank you so much, Professor. This is a very, very um, interesting insight. I, I guess you're, you're calling for the global leaders to form, to, 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 to be more adaptive and to form you know, greater global cooperations to solve the, you know, many problems we're facing. And especially I see, you know, the decentralized governing mentality in Europe and the centralized governing mentality in China, how do, do they reconcile with each other? I think that's gonna be a, a force that will shape the future uh, order of the world. Um, so let me just, I, uh, before you uh, end, I, 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 let me just say that the word adaptive is the key, mm -hmm. key word here that those um, regimes and those social institutions that are more adaptive are the ones that are going to, uh, you know, prevail. And, mm -hmm. and so the question really now is, you know, which are what, what are the adaptive qualities of these various systems, uh, and and that's where the the analysis when we take it to the system level becomes very relevant to solving these global problems. And that's where this particular um, analytical framework that I have so, you know, adapted for my book can be you know, applied to these larger issues that you're raising. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Root. Anna, I guess we can open the floor to the audience to collect questions. Uh, Anna, oh yeah, we, we I guess we can see right, a question from uh, Tom Miller, uh, Professor Ruth. You can see the the. Yeah, screen. It's, can, yeah can you can you out. read it so that everybody yes. will hear will, it at the same time? I will time. read it. So yeah. this is a question from uh, Tom Miller, mm -hmm. which I believe who I believe is an author, uh, is a China expert, writing interesting, great. Uh, you know, China books. So the question is, Professor Root, do you see China evolving towards a more open access order society? I think that that there will be more uh, open access. Um, what form that will take, I'm not sure. I mean, the fact that we're holding this event and the fact that there are thousands of you know Chinese students, both in the UK and in, in, in Europe, excuse me, and in the US and also throughout Europe that suggests open access. I mean, those students are developing ties, linkages uh, institutionally, socially uh, with, with, uh, with others who have you know, shared interests. Uh, so indeed that, that is a question of open access. Now, what happens when these students go back and, and how do these open access uh, personal experiences lead to institutional uh, commitments and institutional uh, behaviors, or let's say organizations. Uh, I, you know, I think we don't know the answer to that. But that's that's what we we need to to see. Uh, I, and and there are many students in this in this in this in, in your program at the Lyle Institute who who are you know who will be the guinea pigs in a sense of this process of creating open access that is you know, compatible both culturally and politically with the well-being of, 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 uh, these, of, of all of our societies. So I agree with the question. I just don't have a clear sense, and I don't think anyone does, of what form that will take. But I think it should certainly be strongly encouraged. But it will be the work of the next generation. And I often say this to my own students is that, um, you know, the connections that they build uh, in their lifetime starting now are really critical. And that's why in my own teaching, I also co-teach a course that's, that's a joint between my university and, and the university in Beijing. It's to help students build those ties uh, and, and, I, and I actually think the student initiative in this regard is going to really be the, the path openers and the path makers. So basically, if I understand correctly, the students here and the audiences here are the agents who uh, boost the local connectivity 
between the Chinese system and the Western system, right? Yes, I think that they will be the agents of this new open access global order that hopefully right. will emerge during their lifetime. Yeah, great. Uh, we now have another question from a, what I see, a, anonymous attendee. The question is, your talk about how decoupling is, how, how decoupling is unrealistic do we have an alternative to this so-called supply chain restructuring? Yes. So, so, so supply chain restructuring is a continuous ongoing process that the cost uh, and benefit of you know, supplying from one region to another is shifting. Uh, even you know, China itself is shifting its own supplies uh, chains some out of China where you know some things can now be produced less expensively. China is no longer exclusively a low cost producer. Uh, so yes, the supply chain, pr the process of global supply chains re, uh, readjusting is a continuous process uh, and, and um, it will take us in new directions you know, as a result of COVID, particularly right now, we, we uh, so I agree with the question. Um, I'm, I, I don't have uh, any prescriptive insight into you know what forms this will take, but um, I think that the notion that we can go back to autonomy and it's the notion of, of economic autonomy or, or uh, that both the United States and, and leaders in China are playing with, and they have the potential, let's say, to think of in terms of they're both enormous economies. They both, to a certain extent, can be standalone economies, but uh, that makes their approach to this, let's say, very different from a country like Germany or the Netherlands, or maybe even the UK, which can't really conceive of a standalone uh, potential. But I think the, the notion that you can be a standalone economy separate from the world, your, separate your domestic market from the world, and then produce and export aggressively uh, to the rest of the world, I think that notion is very unrealistic. Uh, and I think that, that that's not a useful way for uh, world leaders to be thinking of, of how to build a stronger, both domestic and global economy. Um, okay, so uh, do, do we have, other questions from the audience, please um, tap it up in the chat box. Um, so I guess while we are waiting for other questions, I might want to ask Professor Root uh, a question on behalf of some of our master students, because um, your book, you um, examined uh, many great um, big questions in global political economy. So some of our students may also be very interested in understanding, having a deeper understanding of these questions, the great divergence, China's economic rise, and also China's changing role in global governance. So can you maybe uh, give us some recommendations about if we want to go deeper in you know, examining these questions uh, what uh, books or what authors shall we, you know, besides yourself, what authors shall we read about? Um, one, uh, can you? Yeah, so let me just say before we jump into that, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, the way the political economy discussion is focused today is uh, that there's, you know, either a nationalist direction or a or, 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 you know, which is decoupling or, or some, but actually what I do in this book is I show that the whole future of a complex system is, 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 is probabilistic in many, many regards. And that I, I present 12 scenarios in the book of what the future relations between China and the West could be like. Uh, and, and, so, and, and since I've written the book, uh, I've actually would add uh, at least two more potentially um, different outcomes to, to this uh, evolving relationship. Uh, so, you know, 
I, I wouldn't reduce the part the probabilities to only um, to, to only um, to only two. Um, so, um, so I th you know, once again, I think it because the, the audience hasn't really read this book, uh, it, 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 it's hard for them to formulate the questions. Uh, hopefully, they'll become interested in the topic and, and, and pick up a copy. But let me just say, um, again, I, I was tremendously influenced over the course of my career by the approach of, uh, I mentioned John Fairbank, because he was both a historian, but he was also an anthropologist. And he was also somebody who actually had many years of lived experience in China, uh, and which many of our contemporary China specialists in the West don't have and, and can't have anymore because it's hard to actually to go over now, that would be terrible. But let me just say, you can't learn enough about Chinese history if you want to understand China today. Uh, just about everyone I know who has started out interested in contemporary Chinese US affairs has ultimately been led to the conclusion that there are just many, many layers to this onion and you have to start peeling down and, and, and getting deeper and deeper into the history. I think the same thing is true of Chinese students who, who, who want to understand the West. Uh, you know, just understanding post World War II is not going to help because um, it's not going to get you to understand what are the sufficient, what are the foundational values of the West that will never change, and where do they come from, and how they are embedded in the social network systems, both at senior political levels, but also. At, at, at the microscopic level that you once again have to put, go into things like the role of Christianity, the role of the church, um, the role of religion. Uh, it's a very formidable contributor to uh, social behaviors and to, and, to, and to attitudes. So I would say that our programs in China studies in, for, for the West need to be enriched significantly by historical uh, studies and, and deep historical analysis. Uh, the second I would say is, so there are, you know, several uh, great authors uh, who, who have persisted. I mean, one of the, the books that I recommend um, for people who really want to get a deep dive into China is, is, the, is the book here sitting on my shelf, uh, which is called Outlaws of the Marsh, which some of you may know. It's a three volume book. It's a journey into the connectivities of, of China uh, in the in, in written many centuries ago. Um, I actually found that some of these Chinese classics uh, are, 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 are profoundly uh, uh, meaningful to even for someone uh, who wants to understand China today. So. I would, I, would, I would point to those, to those particular books. There are four or five that are indispensable. Um, but I would also then say that what I've done um, and what has enabled me to write this book is, uh, is my studies of systems theory, but network analysis in particular. Uh, this is a very valuable uh, analytical tool that helps us escape some of the uh, straitjackets that we've had uh, conceptually in, 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 in you know, viewing China-US or China-West relations in a kind of bifurcated way, we now can see that these are, these are all different types of systems with different properties, um, some properties in common, some properties that are, are distinctive. So I think that that would be very helpful. I would tell students that if you're if you're studying political science today or international relations today, you should complement your studies with uh, taking some you know computational based courses in network analysis. You'll find it infinitely valuable, and increasingly the data is accessible that wasn't there before. Uh, you know I I think if you can take courses in, in complex systems analysis. Um, not necessarily give, 
Yes. Sorry, Professor. Let me let me uh, uh, cut you short because we are still having two great questions from the audience. Okay. So yeah. uh, we have about five minutes left. Mm -hmm. So let's probably answer these questions first, Absolutely. and then you know. Um. So one question from Si Yuan He. Hi, Professor Root. I'm a student from Strategic Communications. I wonder what kind of implications will complexity structure have in global economy and world order? Uh, this is a very broad question, thanks. And uh, there is another question from a anonymous attendee. Uh, do you think there are some features in the way Chinese social and political systems are networked also make it more capable of promoting certain innovations than the Western systems? Um, so Professor, I'll leave these questions for your, um, you know, you can choose which or you know which one to answer or yes. both of them. Yeah. Yes. So let me go with the last one first because uh, mm -hmm. I think we we didn't speak address that sufficiently. Yes, there mm -hmm. are certain characteristics of the Chinese system uh, of the information dissemination capabilities of the Chinese system as being a centralized system that allow for innovations that that are acceptable to be disseminated very rapidly. So we have seen the rapid dissemination, for example, of financial uh, personal technologies uh, in China. Uh, I think that, that the rapid dissemination is a, is a feature of a centralized system. It economizes on the communication cost of disseminating information. Uh, so that is a virtue, or let's say a, a, a systemic level advantage that, that China has. And, 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 and will continue to have so, so that it also means that innovations that are, you know, uh, that, that are mainstreamed uh, can disseminate across the entire spatial uh, body of China much, much more rapidly uh, than would happen in the West. Uh, so, so that's an advantage as well. And it was an advantage historically, uh, just as it, it, it continues to be today. So, you know, scaling up uh, new technologies uh, is something that, that because of the uh, information economies that China gains from, from having a, an organized centralized uh, system, all of that will, will, you know, those advantages are, 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 are real and significant. Um, so the, 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 pre, the prior question, I missed something. Was that something about contract law? Um, I didn't know. No, didn't... It, it's, it's actually, um... Um, so, no, it's uh, what kind of implications will complexity structure have in global economy and world order? Um, so I think this is all the book is about from both historical and the contemporary perspectives, right? So right. basically your, your book answers this, this question very well. Yeah. Uh, in that regard, I will actually highly recommend everybody to, you know, to grab a copy of the book and uh, read it, you know, you know it's, a, it's really, uh, I really enjoy the whole uh, process of reading it. Um, is there, Professor, is there anything you want to uh, uh, add to this broad question? Or... No, I, I just see, just looking at the clock, I want to thank you enormously for, for this opportunity and to thank Anna for putting this together. And the questions have been uh, f fabulous and really addressing the, the very broad and important topics, many of which I uh, still need to be addressed in future work. I'm still working on this. This is uh, you know, a work in progress. I already have several articles that I've authored that are sequels that, that actually go further into and answer some of these bigger questions that may be uh, left un, unfinished or unresolved some uh, in, in, in the book. So I, I just want to thank you for this great opportunity. And uh, also, I'd like to mention that I'm available, uh, the, you know, through the internet uh, to, if you have specific questions, the audience, um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to answer those and respond to those. So feel free to reach out to me. And thank you all. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Anna, for hosting the event. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you both for such an insightful discussion. We've now come to the end of this webinar.
Um, I'd like to um, thank our audience members as well for joining the conversation today and for sending your questions through. Um, just to note, if you would like a copy of the book, please do use the link and the code provided in the chat box and you'll be able to receive a 30% discount off your purchase. We've also got more events coming up later this month, such as our launch event for our new policy paper on Brazil-China trade. And there will be more book talk events like this coming up later this term. And from, so for more information, please do visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, for now, thank you every, and thank you again, everyone. And I hope to see you all again in our next event. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.